Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes a pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Episode 94 of the Last Round Podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, whether you're joining us for the 94th time, or maybe it's over 100, or the first time, we appreciate it coming off the heels of the of quite a, probably, what, what, do you, what do you say, Mike, the busiest boxing weekend so far, at least in terms of maybe names in the sport, or what do you think? Yeah, in terms of cards as well. Obviously, you've had cards all over the place, you know, from Matt Troom to PBC, Top Rank had a show, uh, Hennessy had a show in um, Hennessy, the UK. Mick what? Hennessy had a show on Channel 5, and then... No oh, Mick, oh, Mick Hennessy, I thought you meant the drink, the, the drink that sponsors Canelo. We should get together. <laughs> Mick, Mick Hennessy, sponsored by Hennessy. Sponsored by Hennessy, sponsored by Hennessy. But like you said, fights and events all over the world this past weekend, um, which is great. You know, it, it kind of shows that boxing is back. I mean, it's been back for obviously a couple months, obviously. But in the swing of things, it's great that there's a bunch of cars every weekend and stuff. Even if there's no fans, at least there's fights going on like this. And a lot of major promoters are back uh, in some type of form, which is great which is great. But uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, thanks again for listening, guys. Um, let's just jump right into it, Mike, and start with this past Friday, the 21st of August from, okay, let's see if I can get this with my uh, my Spanish lingo here. Tora La Vega, Cantabria, Spain, on Fight TV. Your favorite and mine, sexy Sergio Martinez returns after a six-year retirement. I believe he retired in 2014. He returns with a seventh-round KO over Jose Miguel Fandino. What did you think, Mike? I thought, you know, punch-wise, he looked quite good. You know, throwing the combinations. Obviously, you could see he was a little bit slow on the on his feet, you know, due to injuries and age. Um, but it was, you know, it was a kind of ready-made opponent for him. You know, this is obviously in Spain, as you just said, and it looked like there was a little bit of a crowd there. Um, quite a lot of people on Twitter seemed to actually purchase it. I think it was nine ninety nine on Fight TV. Mm-hmm. And obviously sets up what I think everyone's kind of expecting is, uh, you know, Sergio Martinez against Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. rematch. I mean, I saw I saw a couple, a couple clips of his return fight, obviously, this past Friday. I mean, he looked, you know... I, I I don't know what people expected. He didn't really look like anything that popped out to me. I mean, it, he pretty much looked as I expected after six years. I mean, he's in his mid forties. I think he's 45, 46. I mean, what did people expect? Were Were you impressed by, by the skill that he exhibited after six years? No, you know, obviously he wasn't going to roll back the years and come out like he did before. Obviously, you know, father time always wins as they say. But I think, you know, he's come back, I think, just for the challenge because, you know, we interviewed him and then, you know, reading online, it's not like he needs the money. He's not come back for that. He's not blown all of his money that he's made. He, you know, he's invested well. He's a celebrity on TV in Spain and Argentina. He's also a comedian, as we were, you know, chatting to him about. So I think he's just come back for the challenge, you know, just, you know, fighters always have that burning desire, you know, can they still do it? And you know, if he fights like a Julio Caesar. Uh, you know, if he fights Chavez Jr. or maybe even like an Oscar De La Hoya, I could see that maybe happening. Right. You know, it's, it's Chavez may be a little bit too young for him because obviously he's, you know, just fought last year when we were there against Daniel Jacobs. But, you know, fighting like an Oscar De La Hoya, they're both kind of older. Um, I'm sure that would sell. You know, nostalgia always seems to sell. Yeah, you're right. Nostalgia does sell. Uh, it does sell up until the point of the event because after the event is when people are just pissed off. You're like, oh, I didn't get my money's worth or this is boring or this wasn't worth it. I don't know what you guys came back. What sells is the lead up to it, you know, because the majority of the time it doesn't live up to the hype because there's so much hype behind it or there's a there's enough significant hype behind it that it generates interest. Um, 
But, you know, I, I agree. Like, you know, I, th- I think he's he doesn't need the money. Like he's like he, like you mentioned earlier, he was on our show a couple months back. So if anybody wants to listen to that episode, uh, just scroll down in our in our um, in our list of, of podcast episodes on, you know, different platforms. And it's and it's on there. The video version is also on YouTube as well. But, yeah, he did tell us that he, you know, he's a stand up comedian also over there. And then he, you know, he's he's on TV over there. You know, he's he's. He's got a pretty good following in Argentina, in Argentina and Spain. I think you're right. I think he was just more. He he wanted to get back into it just to kind of do something and then maybe get that one last one more payday with Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Um, I think what really, I think how you touched on how we were in Phoenix, Arizona last year, last December for Daniel Jacobs and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. I think. I mean, you know, he watched that fight. And regardless if Chavez Jr. did quit on the store or he got a broken nose or what have you, that arena, especially as being there, those people were behind him up until that point. He was he was a rock star. You know, even Eddie Hearn told us the next day when he was on our show at the Fighter Hotel that he noticed that. He was like, yeah, he's like, this guy's he can make a ton of money. He's like, if he won, he can get pretty significant fights and, and sell out more arenas or, or whatever. I'm pretty sure Sergio and his team saw that and they were like, Hey, you know what? Maybe we can, maybe we can get, get back in there and, and, you know, maybe get one more payday with Chavez jr. I, I, I personally think that it was a Chavez jr. Jacobs fight that pushed Sergio to, to really consider it and really pushed him to, to get back in the ring as he did this past Friday. No, I, I, I would agree with that. You know, seeing Chavez, I think me and you both thought that Chavez was actually winning that fight against Jacobs when he decided to pull himself out of it because he got a broken nose and, you know, was struggling to breathe. And, you know, I'm not a fighter and don't really want to disrespect a fighter, but that's, you know, I'm pretty sure they've been through that, you know, hundreds of times in sparring and in professional fights where people, you know, dislocate the shoulder and they carry on fighting and stuff like that. So kind of a bit of a a cheap way out of the fight, I would have said. So I'm thinking... I wonder if, you know, Marin Villa was watching that, thinking to himself, you know, if that's how easy he quits and, you know, if I put pressure on him, I'm sure they'll make a lot of money. You know, he's got a big following in Spain and Argentina, as we've said. Chavez mm. has a huge legion of fans, you know, in Mexico and in the US, thanks to his father. So it would definitely sell, you know, for both of them. It's a nice, easy payday. And if you're Chavez, you know, how many more chances is he going to get from those, you know, those fans that he has? I mean, do you think Chavez... I, I you think he'll he'll actually do it? Like go 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 through with it and fight him fight him again? I think he has to. I don't even really know how much you know Chavez likes to box. I think it's just that, you know, he has the legion of fans thanks to his father. You know, it's easier than getting a normal proper nine to five job for him. So I think he needs to really take, you know, as many easy paydays as he can before people just get sick of seeing him and or he just, you know, his extracurricular activities take it so far that, you know, that he can't make weight or, you know, he has to retire because of ballooning and weight and, you know, recreational drugs and stuff like that that he uses. Yeah, you're right. That's all, that is always some type of issue. But, I mean, isn't he – wasn't there some news within the last few weeks or so that he's returning in Mexico in yeah. the near future, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do we have a date for that yet? TV box sale put something out. I can't remember if they put a date, but they put like his return. Right. So, I mean, that just shows you like, like these television networks or these, you know, I don't even know if it's going to be on TV over there. I'm sure somebody will pick it up, but he's still polarizing, you know, he's still polarizing enough to generate some type of audience that is worth it for maybe advertisers or, television networks i mean that that's usually the thing i mean as i mentioned earlier look at what eddie hearn told us the following morning after jacobs defeated chavez jr he told us he, he was in the arena he heard those cheers all that energy from that phoenix crowd just you know 95 percent of them were severely behind chavez jr and he pretty much said he's like like, like he was surprised he was like man this this is actually kind of crazy and he pretty much said i can if this guy wins, he's like, man, he could be lined up for some pretty significant, you know, money fights. I mean, he's polarizing. Chavez Jr. is polarizing whether people like it or not, and it's because of his dad. So, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? 
Well, it's just crazy. You know, we interviewed it, you know, Eddie the next morning and, you know, Chavez Jr. literally caused a mini riot, you know, inside, yeah. inside of that stadium or theater, whatever you want to call it. Um, and Eddie still turned around to us and, you know, kind of embarrassingly said, yeah, I'd work with him again. After, you know, because he generated yeah. that much attention, that much money. And, you know, those clips of the riot were everywhere. Absolutely oh, yeah. everywhere. So how much publicity did Matchroom get, good or bad publicity? The zone, you know, they, yeah, was, the zone. They, were, they were still everywhere. So, you know, Eddie kind of was jokingly laughing and, you know, he knew he should, probably shouldn't have said it, but he's like, yeah. I, w- I would work with him again. <laughs> yeah, so. you could. T- yeah, you could tell he hesitated when he gave us that answer, but he pretty much said. I think he also mentioned that Daniel Jacobs that week, the week of the fight week at the weigh in or, or one of the pressers or something. That Jacobs after the presser went was talking to Eddie like in the corner, and Jacobs told him he was like, "You love Chavez, don't you?" And then Eddie Hearn was like, "I kind of do." He was like, "There's something about him that just kind of, you know, he's drawn to like." What, I think he used some type of analogy saying like trying to trying to make a diamond or trying to make a coal into a diamond or something like that. Um, but I mean, you're right. He did say that on our show that he he would probably work with him again, you know, and he and, and, and the next day it was picked up by some outlets for, you know, who credited our show and pretty much said people criticizing him. But I think he knew he knew what he was doing. That's why he hesitated. But he still gave the answer. And for people that don't know, he was also the fight was supposed to be in Nevada. He got banned in Nevada for missing a test. The fight got moved to Arizona. And if I remember rightly, he also missed weight, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it, the, the the pounds, the fights was at contracted at, I think, 173 or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. He was like four pounds over, man. Like it, so Even after all that drama, Eddie Hearn still wanted to work with him. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, Martinez... Martinez is going to come back, and do we know what 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 did he fight on Friday? What pound? What weight class was that? I think it was like middleweight. I'll just pull it up. I'm sure it was some type of catch weight, right? I doubt it was a 160. I'm sure they were just like, oh, let's meet at 165 or something like that. If he really wants to fight Chavez, I think he has to expect to fight Chavez at like 170 ish, from 170 to 175. I think it's realistic. I mean, I can't believe we're talking about it. We're talking about it like it's actually going to happen, which it just probably is going to happen. And if Chavez Jr. wins, especially if he knocks him out in some type of spectac- spectacular fashion, that's going to gain a lot of traction, especially on social media and a lot of sp- Spanish news broadcasts. And it's just going to give more publicity to Chavez Jr. I'm telling you, that's how it's going to work. Did you find it? It says that. It says that Martinez weighed in at 161 and his opponent weighed in at 165. Oh wow. See? I mean I mean I I, I don't I think it's realistic to expect that if he wants to fight Chavez Jr. again in a rematch, then it has to be at 170 ish. What at least in the at least minimum 170. 170 to 175. I mean, I don't think I don't think Martinez can expect Chavez Jr. would be like, oh, yeah, I'll come down to 168. I'll come down to 165. Definitely not 160. Definitely not 165. But, I mean, it, or it could be like this fight. Like this fight where Martinez returned. Martinez comes in at 165 and Chavez Jr. comes in at 175. Or 173 or something like that. Right? Chavez just ch- weighs in at what Chavez weighs in. Pretty much. You, you just fight at Chavez weight. Pretty much. I. That's the... If Martinez, re- <clears throat> if Martinez really wants this fight, he's going to have to bend to Chavez Jr.'s rules. Chavez Jr. is probably going to be like, look, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it as long as the money's right. And you're going to have to let me weigh in at whatever I want. Not necessarily whatever he wants. I'm sure there's going to be like a cap, but he's going to be like, there's no rehydration clause. If I come in at 172, he's like, I can balloon up to 190 the next like. It's going to be stuff like that. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. Because Martinez isn't, even, even at 45, 46 or whatever he is, he's not, um, he's not a light heavyweight. He's, I mean, he, he barely, to me, he barely looks like a, like a super middleweight, right? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do, you know, with all these people returning, like Oscar De La Hoya, Tyson, Roy Jones Jr., Evander Holyfield, so. I mean, I guess. I mean, I... 
And then touching on the De La Hoya thing, I really don't think he's going to come back. I think he's just capitalizing on the publicity because of Tyson, of Roy Jones, now Martinez, mostly of Tyson and Roy Jones, honestly, because Tyson is such a universal casual brand. I mean, you see TMZ covering him every single week, you know, like you see all these other major global news agencies, media agencies covering him who have, who never cover boxing. They're not, they're just general news sources uh, or tabloids and stuff like that. I honestly think De La Hoya is just capitalizing on the moment of the publicity behind Tyson. So De La Hoya kind of threw his name in, in, in the box just to be relevant enough to try to gain that publicity, which honestly, from a marketing standpoint, really isn't, it's really not stupid. I mean, you know, he, he, I think he was picked up by TMZ as well, that he wants to come back and some other major news outlets. He's just capitalizing on the publicity, whether people like it or not. Did you see what Dana? Know. Did you see what Dana White said last night about him? Do what? Do I ha- do I really have to guess? I mean, we know he doesn't like the guy. Someone asked him, "You're like, oh, did you hear about uh, Oscar De La Hoya's, you know, return after the UFC event last night?" And Dana White was like, "Yeah, cocaine's expensive." <laughs> I'm telling you, that guy doesn't hold back. That guy doesn't hold back, man. Like, it, I don't know, man. You know, the crazy part about it is that like they used to be friends, you know, yeah. like. Dana White was at the, I think, the Canelo Triple G, the first one. I think he was there in person, and like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't think it. I don't think it's wise to have Dana White as your as your enemy, especially when Dana White has said that he's gonna get, he's going to get into boxing, and obviously he has a lot of resources behind him. And I, I don't know. I mean, whatever. It is what it is. Like, it's not like De La Hoya. De La Hoya is obviously a prominent figure in the sport, and so is his promotion company. And, you know, even though people talk about, like, their demise or they don't have any champions or this, this, and that, Golden Boy always finds a way, you know, to pretty much stay a staple in the sport. But Dana White and De La Hoya, you know, you can always bet on on that entertainment to to take up your day, right? Yeah, it's always it's always good to good to watch, good to read. You know, Dana White doesn't hold back, so it's never kind of funny. Never. Uh, so moving on to this past Saturday, the twenty second of August, from the finale at Matchroom Square Garden Fight Camp on the Zone uh, in the backyard of Matchroom Headquarters. Is it still Matchroom Headquarters as of this day? Or is yeah, it- yeah, they use it as the obviously when he was growing up, he lived there, and then right. Um, they just were going to sell it and then they decided just to keep it and use it as, you know, Matchroom hates Q. So, hey, that works. That works. But starting with the main event, probably the most significant moment of this past weekend, at least in terms of shock value and, and newsworthy headlines, Alexander Provetkin with one of the best boxing shots i've seen at least this year knocks out dylan white or dillian White. is it dylan or dillian can i get that right i, I always say dylan but i think it's dillian when you watch the ufc and you watch the ifl tv interviews and if you kind of look at the way it's spelt right okay i think it's dillian so i want to make sure i get that right pavetkin knocks out dillian white with a sweet left-handed uppercut and some great head movement and just Sends him to the floor. White was knocked out before he even touched the floor. What did you think, Mike? Pavekin. You know, looking at a lot of people on Twitter, I don't know whether they went for the the Pavekin pick because of the odds. You know, you could get him just to win the fight at like 14 to 1, and I've seen odds as high as like 18 to 1 for Pavekin to win by knockout. You know, as the fight started, you could see that I thought Pavetkin had kind of got old. I thought he looked kind of slow. You know, he didn't have great foot movement. He'd only throw a couple of shots, you know, and then he'd kind of try to, like, hold. Every time, I think after the first round, he went back to his corner. He looked absolutely fucked. Uh, (laughs) You know, I thought Dillian White, after the second, third, and fourth round, you know, his jab looked good. He he still has that, you know, bad, um, uh, you know, with where he kind of leans over his his front foot, like everyone was kind of pointing out afterwards. And right. then, you know, he knocked he knocked Povetkin down twice in the fourth. I think, you know, maybe he got a little bit lazy in the fifth. Um, came out, Povetkin had been throwing, you know, kind of leaned down to his left, 
dropped his shoulder and then was firing that left hook. You know, most of the time in the first few rounds, he was just firing it like into the body, decided to mix it up. Boom, just came through absolutely punch perfect. He put absolutely every ounce of his soul behind that punch. Connected him. Yeah, knocked him out. You know, like you said, he was out before he even hit the floor. And I think that really was, I think Pavecchio obviously, you know, being down twice and mixed it up with that shot. And I think it was just literally kind of one of those shots where he kind of threw it, hoping it, you know, you know, hit him and knocked him out because I think he knew it was game over. You know, he was losing because Povetkin was so happy. Like you'd seen Povetkin win fights before. He just kind of walks back to his corner. Yeah. Because he's been boxing. He's very mellow. Yeah, he's very mellow. He was shouting, jumping up. His corner ran in and hugged him because they knew. I think they knew it's game over. Like we're, we're done. You know, he's going to knock us out soon. Um, kind of like when he fought David Price. You know, David Price, you know, rocked him. And I think Povetkin, if I remember right, he like, kind of like stumbled back against the ropes. And then he did the same thing there. He kind of like, you know, punch out of nowhere and boom, just knocked out Price. I would have said that Povetkin is actually the better boxer than White. He just, you know, lacked a lot of physical things. He's a lot smaller. You know, Dylan Wright had a better reach. But in terms of like throwing combinations and, you know, just being an actual tactician, I thought Povetkin was obviously better. And that's why a lot of people kind of jumped on the odds. But, you know, after those first four rounds, he did look old. He looked, I thought, no, he very, did. It's very yeah. sluggish. And he just got that punch. You know, he meant it. It wasn't a fluke. I'm not trying to say anything like that, but it was just so sweet. Knockout of the year. By far, I don't think anything's going to be that. Yeah, I agree. I agree on the, that it, it, it should be looked at as of right now as a knockout of the year before, obviously, the end of the year, which we, we could see another one. Um, they could obviously beat it, but I agree. Uh, the first four rounds, I thought Pavekin looked really old. You know, he is, I believe he's 40 already. 41 um, in like two weeks, they were saying. Yeah, so he's 40, 41. And I don't think it was unrealistic to for people to think, especially the betting odds odds makers to to say that, oh well, you know, Pavekin's got a lot of mileage on his tank, you know, he's he's been in a lot of wars, he's been in there with a lot of big, you know, prominent names in the heavyweight division. Um and like you said, the first four rounds, he went down like three he went down three times. I think he went down three times in the fourth or the third or something like that. Um and I, I don't think it was I don't think it was unrealistic to expect that, especially after not only the first knockdown, but the second knockdown that Dillian White was on his way to some type of stoppage or maybe a decision win. You would think after three knockdowns, it would be some type of stoppage, you know, but like you said, Pavekin, that Russian strength, man. And it, you know what? He didn't even really have like that much torque behind it. They were fighting on the inside. They were fine on the inside, and then he just kind of he he gave him that head movement where he kind of he 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 missed his jab. I think I believe Dillian White gave him a a or was it a right right jab I believe, and then Dylan uh, Pavekin just kind of sideswiped it, kind of went under it in a little bit, and then gave him that uppercut, which was awesome. That's literally I, we were texting about that, um, you know, sometime after the fight. And we were talking about how, like, pretty much that's, at least to me, that's the definition of boxing, you know? Like, that's a, that's a skill. That's a skill. And like you said, Pavekin was obviously very happy. His corner was very happy. I think to me, like, you know, before we move on to, to, to Dillian White and what his prospects are for now after this and stuff like that, I think the, to me, even though, you know, I know Pavekin's been popped for juicing in his career and stuff like that. But in the last, you know, 10 years or so, I think when you look at the landscape of the heavyweight division, I think Pavekin has to be named as like, as like that guy that was never like, you know, the star of the division or maybe included as a star of the division. But he was always that guy that like, OK, you know, if you want to think if you want to put one name in each division throughout, you know, the, the last so odd years that really kind of will give you a fight, like he's dangerous. I think Pavekin is that guy, at least in the heavyweight division, at least for the, you know, maybe what, last five, ten years, right? Yeah, I would agree with that, because if you look at his record, he's, he's only lost to Anthony Joshua and Kalichko. Right. You know, and he's, yeah. had a lot, he's had a lot of fights. He was scheduled to fight Wilder, and then he popped, and, you know, the fight got cancelled. And if you look at the uh, Joshua fight, he, he rocked Joshua, and it was actually doing really well until... You know, the tide was turned in the other way and, you know, Joshua got him out of there. 
Right. So, you know, he's and then he's fought a lot of British people. I mean, he loves fighting British fighters by the looks of it. You know, he beat Huey Fury, he beat David Price, you know, did very well against Joshua, knocked out Dylan White. So, you know, he's been in there with, you know, the upper echelons of the division. Just unfortunately, you know, he never he was around during the Kalichko era. Then he was around during the uh, you know the um, the Auntie Wilder era, Joshua and you know Tyson Fury. So just unfortunately never you know been able to to get the uh, to get any of the titles. So no, right, right, no, you're right. And then you know obviously White, it was obviously a big surprise to not only Dillian White but um, to Eddie Hearn, his promoter, Matchroom, and stuff like that. And I think I think one of the funny thing is is that. The WBC had said that, oh, you know, if, if Dillian White wins, he will be the he will get a shot next at the winner of Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, um, which I think is hilarious. Like, because he's for three years, yeah, he's 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 coming up on a thousand days. That's I think that's what I saw a thousand days that he's been mandatory, and obviously, like, if that doesn't really show you the bias between these sanctioning bodies, like, what else is it going to tell you? Like, you know, that it, it, it tells you it's, it's money, it's you know, they their preference is certain fighters, you know. I I don't know. And then I think they also said like, oh, I think uh WBC Mauricio Suleiman said that um, you know, beforehand, I think he said after that Pavetkin, even though he won, he doesn't get that spot as a mandatory or you know, it was only if Dillian White won. Like how how does that make sense? Like I get like Dillian White is has been in that position for a while, but it's just like, oh, but if the guy beats you Technically, like, oh, well, he's even though he beat him or if, if he does beat him when he was talking retroactively, that he wouldn't get his spot. I, can, I don't know. I, can, I mean, I, I, I see it, but it's just it just it sounds like it just sounds weird to me. Yeah, it sounds I, fishy. I, it's like having a title on the line for only one person, you know, even though they both made weight. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of odd. I can kind of see why he's saying that because Dylan White spent those thousand days, you know, going through like WBC Silver, WBC International, WBC Diamond, WBC Interim. You know, he's jumped through all of those hoops, and because of you know the WBC keep pushing it back, and you know they keep they obviously wanted to just to try and feed off you know Deontay Wilder as you know as much as they could, and then obviously due to the Wilder Fury, you know. Fighting three times, it's been uh, pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Um, but it's it's one of those situations where you look at Dylan White, and you know we he, he could have sat, you know, at mm. home, just fought nobody, fought a load of taxi drivers, you know, and waited for his title shot. But you know he dared to be great. You know he wanted to learn on the job. You know he fought, you know Joseph Parker. He fought Oscar Rivas. He took the Pavetkin fight when he didn't really need to. You know, it obviously ended up, you know, falling flat on his face because he ended up being defeated by Pavekin. But it's one of those situations where, you know, if, how how often do we complain about, you know, fighters not wanting to fight the best? They just wanted to fight easy people until, you know, they get to like 32 or 0 and then they fight one good person, get beat, but they've, you know, they've already cashed in on those 32 victories. So it's kind of one of those where you have to kind of weigh it up. Like, what do we want as fans, you know, and, you know, in media? We always complain about something, you know, like he actually went in there and fought probably one of the best resumes in the heavyweight division. And then we all, you know, laugh at him or, you know, right. t- tell him he's an idiot for taking the fight. You know, what What do we want? No, right. You're right. I completely agree. Um, I, I also think White kind of looks a little bit dumb for all these years. It's not, he didn't look dumb for, you know, obviously he's been mandatory with WBC and they've just kind of pushing it. I'm sure the WBC behind closed doors loves this. You know, oh, they yeah. they they love that he lost, and especially that he got knocked out because they don't want him to have the belt. They don't want to give him a chance to fight for the belt. I don't, know, I don't belt. know why. I don't know why because he gets big paydays. He's on pay per view. It's not like he's. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a heavy. Like, it's not like that. He's not earning any money. He doesn't put bums on seats. You know, at the end of the day, we all know that the sanctioning bodies want fighters that generate income because that's the only way they get their nine percent or whatever it is. So they want them. That's why they always throw it to Canelo because right. he generates crazy amounts of money. So the amount of money that they get is obviously large. Dylan right. White is the pay per view fighter. There's not many pay per view fighters in the world, yet they don't want him to have it. I'm sure he generates more income than than Deontay Wilder did. Wilder couldn't even sell out in Alabama. Right? No, his you're home, right. His hometown. I, yeah, you're you're right. I completely Tuscaloosa, Alabama, over there. And I also think like 
I mean, you got to look at it from a geography perspective. And this is just me speculating. The WBC is headquartered in Mexico, and they also have an office here in, in I believe, in Los Angeles. Um, and if Dillian White wins, he will be making some defenses of it in the UK. You know, obviously from a from a travel perspective, and this is just me looking at like a common denominator here from a travel perspective to send your guys over there and stuff like that. Like it's a lot longer to travel, to set up shop and stuff like that. Like, you know, whereas if you have a champion in the States, you know, it's a lot easier in terms of logistics, if that makes sense. Like, you know, obviously, I mean, and I'm just speculating here again, but I mean, if we look at the list of WBC champs, uh, you know, I guarantee you that at least the more prominent ones, the money generating ones are based in the United States. Right. I, I would have to look, but yeah, but I mean, Mauricio used to do it. He used to do it for Charlie Edwards. Cause obviously there was that fight where Mauricio was in the crowd where he was beaten by, you know, Martinez, but Martinez hit him when he was on the floor and Mauricio right. ended up, you know, reversing, well not reversing the decision. He ended up calling it a contest. So, you know, right. Mauricio does, you know, oh, right. you know, he he was flat. He flew out there to represent the WB. But Charlie Edwards, I mean, that's, a, get, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, so he, he's going to do it for Dillian White. I mean, I, I I honestly think I think it just like you said, it comes back to the money, to the money thing. Is that the Dillian White? He he does generate ratings and and he does fight on pay per view over there. But in terms of when you compare him to a Wilder. Uh, a Tyson Fury, an Anthony Joshua, you know, uh, uh, guys like that. I think that the, how they look at it in terms of getting a, a cut of their purse, it's totally, there's, there's a big discrepancy there. It's a drastic change, if that makes sense. Like that kind of maybe, that kind of maybe nullifies my, my, my previous argument about the whole travel. It's at the, down the belts in the UK and this, this and that Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua, are such big stars now that somebody like the WBC would want their title on them because of the money and the, and the ratings they generate. They're like, Oh, they're way too big. Like, I mean, it's not that they're way too big, like, man, like they're big enough in their own right that they have to like, yeah, we, you know, we have to play by those rules just like Canelo, you know? Whereas I honestly think I, even though you do say that, Dillian White does generate ratings and fight on pay-per-view and he does do well, and especially in the UK, more in the UK. I just don't think the WBC recognizes that because they use a comparison model to compare his stock to Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua, and even Deontay Wilder, because Deontay Wilder, you said he doesn't even sell out his home city in Alabama, yeah. but he gets paid really well. He well that's, paid- just the, that's just the PBC working. Oh, you're right. In- no, working in right. debt somehow. No, you're right. But at the end of the day, the WBC gets a cut of that purse. No, no exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I I don't know. I, I think I think White comes back and he does beat Pavekin. And then people and obviously there's gonna be people if he beats him and if he especially if he stops him, there's gonna be people, oh, there should be a trilogy. Pavekin deserves a third a third fight now because they split one. But that's not gonna happen. That's not going to happen. That's not in the cards. That's really not in the cards. I'd be surprised if there was a third fight. Unless there's like no nobody out there who wants to fight White or he can't get one of these big guys again and he's still screwed for like another thousand days, then maybe. But I don't see being a trilogy. Um, I think White is, 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 call, is right to be the favorite again in the rematch, which I think Eddie Hearn said he wants to do in October. But... I don't know if it's going to really... December. Dece- oh, he wants to do it in December for White, the rematch? Yeah, that's what they were saying afterwards, yeah. Well, I thought... What, what, wasn't the whole tentative plan to have Dillian White win this fight against Pavekin and then fight Joshua, Anthony Joshua in December? Wasn't that the tentative plan? The tentative plan was supposed to be... I don't think it was kind of set in stone, but obviously Joshua's got to fight... Pulev in December, either behind closed doors or you know, if like a minimum crowd. Right. I think I think they're now trying to get those two maybe on the same schedule, so they're going to try to do the Pavekin and White um, rematch either in December, maybe on the undercard. But I think right. that'll obviously depend on how much the purses are going to be for you know that four heavyweights. That's going to be an expensive card. So, right. 
No, you're that's right. what I would. I was watching IFL TV and you know boxing social and everybody this morning, and that seemed to be what they were kind of uh, throwing around those dates. Right. Yeah. I mean, I get it, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think uh, it, it's it's wise to think that Anthony Joshua and and Dillian White will fight this year. I don't even think Anthony Joshua is going to fight this year. Um, I think you're not going. We're not going to see him until sometime next year, maybe maybe March or April. Um, just because there was, this is a wrench thrown into those plans, obviously. But I mean, we'll see. We'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. But you know, I, I, one other thing before we move on to the next topic here, don't you think that I don't want to? Don't you think? But I saw somebody on Twitter um, say that Dillian White has always been overrated. What do you think about that? In terms of actual boxing talent, I would say. Maybe so, but in terms of, you know, his his popularity, because he just gets everyone in fights, and I think people like that. But in terms of actual skill, I would not say, you know, he's no Povetkin. Um, but you've got to remember that a lot of the heavyweights aren't really technically that great. Like, if you look at Dylan White, I don't think he's technically brilliant. Anthony Joshua, I think, is very robotic. I think Fury is the best one. By far, yeah. yeah. You know, but then if you look at Wilder, he's technically terrible. You know, like he can't even stand on his own two feet. He falls around the ring. He literally relies on a one and a two. Like he doesn't can't really throw uppercuts. He doesn't really throw any hooks. Sometimes he doesn't even use a jab. He just literally relies on, you know, winding up that number two and hitting home. So it depends on what you look at, you know. I think people are just sometimes just kind of pissed off at the fact that he's never been a world champion, yet he's on pay-per-view. And right. I, think, I think that pisses people off. But, you know, if you look at, in terms of the numbers that he does and in terms of how exciting his fights are because he's vulnerable. He got dropped by Rivas, ended up winning the fight, got, you know, knocked down Povetkin twice, ended up getting KO'd, you know, knocked Parker down, then got knocked down himself and was luckily saved by the bell because he was literally so gassed and tired that he was literally out on his feet in the 12th round. You know, it's, it's he's exciting to watch and I think that's why, you know, he, he is... Like he is the popularity. Look at Dave Allen, prime example. You know, never been a world champion, not that good a boxer at all, but people relate to him. You know, he's a nice guy. You know, he kind of, he suffers with depression and people can connect with him. You know, he was, was he a pay-per-view fighter for that David Price fight? I think he, I think it was a pay-per-view card. I don't right. remember whether he headlined it or whether he was like a co-main. Similar sort of thing. Ryan Garcia, never been a world champion. He's not a world champion now. He might be on pay-per-view. So it really depends on the way you look at it. You know, it depends. How would you weigh it up? Like, is in terms of ability, maybe not. But in terms of popularity, putting bums on seats, and you know, excitement, yeah, Dylan White, I would say, you know, is where he is. Right, right, yeah. I think, I think you're right. You I mean, obviously, he's still doing good for himself. So we'll see where where it moves on. But it's going to be interesting to see how this heavyweight landscape pans out, at least for Dylan White. Um, you know, because you could be the best fighter in the world. The best fire, Rigandau and Lara, probably two good examples. But unless you're exciting, you're not going to get paid and you're not going to be a pay-per-view. And, you know, you could be the, a multi-world champion selling out arenas, but if you have that very boring Cuban style, no one's going right. to come and watch you. Right. You either have, I mean, I think everybody knows this, but you either have to have some type of personality to be able to sell your fights outside of the ring or be able to sell your fights inside of the ring with KOs or or some type of drama or something like that. It has to be one or the other. Look at Triple G. Triple G was able to sell himself because he was knocking everybody out. Because he, he can't everybody. English isn't great, so he yeah. can't do it the other yeah. way. Yeah. And, and also and also what and also what happened too, which was great for his career, is that he was in the same division, the same pretty much the same weight class as the as the biggest star Arguably, uh, you know, behind Mayweather, the second biggest star at that time behind Canelo Alvarez, which also helped because his name was associated with them. I mean, it, you know, you know, I mean, no fighters call out other fighters or they try to associate them with the interview so it can connect them to their names. And then these media outlets start talking about both names like, oh, you know, they're both talking about each other. Or he's calling him out and he's winning and he's knocking everybody out. You know, like it also helped that his name was able to be associated with the biggest star in boxing so but 
going back to the original point, he was knocking everybody out and made people notice. So we're like, oh, I want to see this guy knock everybody out. He has like 20 KOs in a row. So like you said, like you touched on then is if you take out, take away the Wilder fight, Tyson Fury before he was like that. He used to sell it outside of the ring with his talking and his trash talk and his crazy uh, entrances. But quite often his fights were terrible. Like in terms yeah. of look at the Kalichko fight. If yeah. you rewatch the Kalichko fight, send you to sleep. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, it was from a boxing standpoint, it was it was tactical. Like you know, obviously we can still appreciate it. But you're right though, to the casual fan, especially in the heavyweight landscape, the heavyweight division, people expect to see blows, to see knockouts, to see just like Pavekin knocking out Dillian White. You know, heavyweight boxing at its finest. You know, a guy who was knocked down three times before in the previous round comes back with a with a great placed uppercut and sends the guy to the floor and knocks him out. So, you know, but it's always going to be like that. You know, it, it, there's always going to be like that. There, there, there's a there's obviously a, a an ingredients factor to really generate that popularity or that interest in your career, and then you just kind of have to find it or decide on which route to go. That's pretty much it. Uh, also on that card, the co-main event, uh, another a rematch from the initial fight, which was one of the best fights from a female perspective in the year. Uh, Katie Taylor gets a unanimous decision win in another hard-fought battle against Delphine Pursoon uh, for the WBC, WBC, WBA, WBO, and IBO lightweight titles. What would you think of the rematch? Great fight. I mean, I, lo- I loved the first fight. I thought Pursun won the first fight. I thought this fight was literally like they just started the next round. The bell went. They both came out. And, you know, Katie Taylor at times would stick to her boxing, which, you know, she should have done because Pursun really was just one of those fighters that just came out and just kind of throws as many punches as she can. Some of them are kind of like, you know, more like slaps than, you know, actual, you know, technique where she's going to back Katie up. But she throws that many punches that... You know, she wins rounds. Um, KE at times got kind of dragged into Pursun's style of fight and just sat in the pocket with her, you know, like at the end of the, end of the is it the 12th round? Did they do 10 rounds or 12? I can't remember. I think it was 10. I think it was 10. So at the end of the 10th round, she they literally just stood in the center of the ring, just stood in the pocket and just traded bows, you know, which is kind of good to watch. It probably, I would say definitely up there with the best female fights I think I've really ever seen. You know, those two. I, I would I would watch a third. I think even Pursun agreed this time because if you looked on Twitter, there was quite a few people that had Pursun winning. Uh, but Pursun was very respectful. You know, she said that she didn't think she'd won. She didn't think she had the power at this weight to be able to back Katie up where she thought she did in the first fight. Because uh, there was quite a few people that had Pursun ahead. I think Lou DiBella was one, you know, celebrity that boxing personality you know that um had pursuing winning you know onwards and upwards i think you know katie's probably going to look for another big name hopefully we see the serrano fight and you know i'd be you know i'd be i wouldn't be adverse to you know later down the line they both go away get a few more wins and we have you know katie taylor pursuing three you know with a crowd which i think would be great no you're right you're right i think pursuing even though she lost again still keeps her name relevant in that division in the in female boxing um the plan is tentatively to have katie taylor and recently unified welterweight champion jessica mccaskill likely go at it and then maybe sometime next year um i'd probably add some type of catch weight or something which i mean in terms of weight issue mccaskill fighting taylor from a weight perspective is actually a little bit better because i know cecilia break who's was weighed more and it was going to be a little bit harder to find like a, like a midpoint or something. So in terms of that, I guess it's good for, for both of them in terms of a competitive standpoint. But I think, like you said, even though pursue acknowledged that she probably didn't win the fight, her name is still involved in the mix. It's her style. Yeah. She just comes out and just throws and throws and throws. And because the two minute rounds, like Andy Clark kind of touched on, you know, last week when we had him on the show, that she can just go go hell for leather for two minutes, and then she's got a minute rest, and then she just goes again. Right? You know, crazy. You know, there's not a lot of power and technique behind all the punches, but she just throws so many. Whereas, you know, like Katie Taylor was the more polished boxer, and 
you know, like Andy said, if you had like bars above the heads, like a computer game, you know, I think Katie Taylor, every time she would connect, she'd probably knock off, you know, more, more energy, more life than, um, than Pursun does, but she just connects and hits like so many times. Right. It's, it's good, good to watch, but in terms of, you know, if you're a boxing purist, you know, you may not like the technique, but it was just great, you know, fun, fun fight. You just sit back and, you know, don't be so negative and just watch it as a fight, you know, for fun. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, I think now the 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 tentative plan, which was obviously the 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 initial plan at the beginning of all this, at least at the beginning of the year, was Katie Taylor against Amanda Serrano, um, and then you mentioned Lou DiBella kind of going on Twitter and saying that he felt Delphine Pursun took the fight. That doesn't really surprise me because I think he represents Amanda Serrano. Yeah, he does. And yeah. they and they've had issues with Katie Taylor. Obviously, the fight wasn't made and stuff, so that's not really a surprising a surprising uh, tone. But it, but but. But obviously, it it it's it it could be right because Pursun did fight well. It was a it was a close fight again. It was you know it was an action packed fight. So obviously, she there's, there's a chance that she probably could have got the decision because they were close cards. At least two of them were. One of them was pretty wide. But I think honestly, if if Katie Taylor and Jessica McCaskill were going to go at it, if I was Delphine Pursun, I fight Amanda Serrano. In the meantime, right. Yeah, why not? You know, it's they're probably the top four, you know, in and around those weight categories because obviously they kind of have to keep moving in between due to, you know, not many big names and fights to be made. But yeah, I mean, why not? You know, strike while the iron's hot. If you're going to, you know, make that money, get a few fights, get a few victories, and then, you know, just call for the Taylor Pursuit fight because it's not many women's fights, I think, that we watch where, you know, we all turn around and go, God, that was a good fight. You know, I'd, lo- I'd love to see that again. You know, they generally right. tend to be either blowouts or, you know, kind of boring, you know, unanimous decisions. So, yeah, it's just no, not, right. no strength in depth yet. That's the problem. Yeah, well, that, that, that that's a big factor. That's a big factor that people have to acknowledge. It's the depth of the women's divisions. So, but, you know, at least, they're, at least and, and, you know, they're getting a lot of attention and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of like Katie Taylor to see the break who's, you know, Jessica McCaskill now the new unified champion at World to Weight, um, Clarissa Shields and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of attention on it. They just need the depth. So hopefully, as time goes by, it's going to take a while. It's going to take uh, you know years, but hopefully, they're on their way there to to make the to make the divisions a little bit more appealing, like UFC does. You know, well, I think that's the problem. I think if you're a young girl and you're into combat sports in general, you know, and you look at the path of the bo- of boxing. Or you look at the path of you know joining, you know Bellator, UFC, or you know one championships. I think personally, I think they would choose the UFC. Just you know, it's a brighter, more polished, very you know well executed in terms of advertising. You know, you've got like Amanda Nunez, you know Paige Van Zandt, who's just signed a huge, huge you know million dollar contract with bare knuckle boxing. I think personally, at the minute, I think you would choose that route. So they need to try and make it you know more appealing for this, you know, the young girls that want to get into into boxing. You're right. You're right. Uh, but also on that card, uh, Chris Congo gets the ninth round TKO over Luther Clay for the WBO Global Welterweight title. Global? Is that a new title? What the hell's going on around here? Uh, what did you think of Congo's performance? I thought it was a good fight, close fight, good in terms of uh, you know technique, probably one of the better fights in terms of that You know, out of the whole card. Uh, I thought the right person won, good finish to the fight. You know, onwards and upwards for both of them. I think you know, you know, even though he lost, I thought he looked he looked really good. Did Clay? So I don't think really, you know, any of them are gonna struggle to uh, come back out of that fight. So we'll see. Uh, also on that card, Jack Cullen gets the split draw over Zach Chelly. Did I pronounce that right? I believe I did. Uh, what do you think about that split draw? Terrible decision. Absolutely what? terrible decision. What? You know, Zach Chelly clearly won the fight, so I have absolutely no idea what the referee was watching there. I think pretty much everybody on, you know, the, in the Twitter world kind of agreed with that. So, you know, it kind of, I sat there and I thought, oh, here we go. Like, if the, uh, you know, the Taylor Pursuit fight goes to the cards, like, you know, what kind of crazy score are you going to come up with now after seeing that? I think even Eddie touched on it after, afterwards that, um, you know, Zach Chelly really should have you know, taken the, uh, taken the victory that night. So, you know, Cullen really got away with one there. Right. 
And we'll see. Uh, Alan Basic gets a, Alan Basic, excuse me, gets the second round TKO over Shondell Terrell Winters. What do you think of that? I think that was an autocorrect. It should be Alan Babich. I think the uh, autocorrect oh. in, the, in the Word document did it. It Come was a um, good, uh, good kind of street fight more than a more than a more than boxing. You know, Alan Babich was one of the fighters that's been signed by Dylan White. You know, they keep calling him the savage. You know, he did quite a few funny interviews with Eddie Hearn just because he's one of those like kind of crazy, you know, Russian guys that'll just fight anybody. So he kind of went in there with Sean Del Winters, who would fought Parker before and actually went a few rounds with Parker and actually looked quite good against Parker. So I don't really know what happened because Babbage just went in there and just kind of blew him out. So I don't know whether Sean Del was just scared of his power or he got clocked early on and just decided to back up because, you know, he's kind of scared or whatever. But you know, Babbage kind of made easy work out of him. We dropped him a few times, and luckily, uh, he, either the ref stopped it or, you know, his corner threw in the towel. I can't remember exactly which, or maybe it happened at the same time. But, you know, Babbage obviously called out pretty much everybody, was asking Eddie Hearn to give him the biggest heavyweight that he could find in his stable. <laughs> so, you know, he's a bit of a character, you know, so whilst we, uh, you know, whilst we have him around, he'll be fun, I think. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and then moving on also this past Saturday from the Microsoft Theater in downtown Los Angeles, it was Showtime on Fox as Showtime Sean Porter gets the 12 round unanimous decision win over Sebastian Formella. Uh, this was for the vacant WBC silver welterweight title. And also, I believe Formella was the IBO welterweight champion, um, which I believe he held, but I don't know if it was on the line. But yeah, giving some credit to the IBO there. Bring them back, man. They, they, you know, might as well throw the IBO in there as a, ma- as, a, as a recognized major sanctioning body. You know, I don't see what the difference is between all these other ones. You know, might as well throw them back in there. Um, but, you know, Sean Porter returns after almost a year since I believe he fought uh, Errol Spence and lost his title to Errol Spence um, in a unified matchup. Um, Porter pretty much showed, you know, the type of fighter he is. He's, he's, he's in your face. You know, it looks like a... Uh, for Formella, pretty much, I it, to me it looked like Formella did have pretty good technical skills, and he was a good boxer. He obviously has a foundation, and he's he's good. But it's just Porter's just been in the ring with so many elite guys like Thurman, Garcia, Spence, like, and and he's in your face. You know, it's that pressure. Like it just doesn't stop. I mean, what what you think of Porter's performance? Yeah, I think he kind of hit the nail on the head, really. You know, he started fast and then just basically kept that usual pace, which, you know, people can't normally handle. You know, they finished with, you know, Porter landed 304 punches and Formella only landed 148. So twice as much. I would have liked to have seen Sean Porter get Formella out of there, you know, either whether he, you know, managed to knock him out or makes the referee stop it. Just because... You know, Formella is not one of those big names. So I think when you get somebody like a Sean Potter in there with somebody that's not generally a household name, you kind of expect them to try to, you know, either knock them out or get them out of there. So, you know, trying to make a bit of a statement since this is his first fight back since the Errol Spence fight. And I think I also saw on Twitter this was like an IBF eliminator. And I think now Potter's, you know, one of the favorites to be, to get in there with the winner of Spence and Danny Garcia. So we could get a, a rematch of Sean Potter, Errol Spence, which was, uh, you know, a pretty good fight. And I think a lot of people were split. A lot of people liked Sean Porter's, you know, come forward uh, style, you know, all out attack. And some people actually had Porter beating Spence on that night. No, you're right. Yeah. And I, that's a good point. How you said that this was like a double, this is like a double eliminator for Spence's IBF and WBC titles. So now, now it puts Porter back in, in the mandatory spot to get the winner of Garcia and Spence, which is, you know, it's not a bad place to be. You know, he loses the fight. He loses his title. He wins one more fight. And he's back. He's back in in the pretty much almost in the driver's seat again. So, you know, but I like Sean Porter, man. Um, I've always been a fan. I think that he he he's he's I think he has, in terms of resume, I think it's him and then Danny Garcia who have fought all these guys now. Like, I think as of right now, Porter's fought all the probably has the best resume in terms of fighting all the elite guys so far. Um, and I think Danny Garcia is right behind him. I, I believe so. But, you know, Porter's just in your face, man. Like, he, he obviously shows you that he's going to give you that type of fight every single time. You can try to fight him, 
you can try to have a game plan to try to fight him however you want to fight him, but it's going to come down to you adapting to his style, you know? And, you know, I, I think, and, and I know Terrence Crawford has been in there in the mix. I know they mentioned him on the broadcast yesterday. Um, and him and Porter, Porter's already said that he's tried to make that fight or that he's want that fight. They've been talking, but I mean, honestly, top rank needs, if, if Porter was open to it, they needed, they needed to just give him the, need to figure out the contract and, and give Crawford that fight. Cause obviously Porter's going to wait for Garcia and, and, uh, Spence to go at it, which I still don't think is going to happen realistically for Porter and Crawford to go at it, but. I think Top Rank did miss miss the boat by not making a fight with Porter when Porter was vocal about trying to make that fight. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I think this kind of goes back to what, like we touched on, you know, Dillian White taking the fights that he didn't need to take whilst he was waiting for that mandatory shot. And this is an example of where, you know, we're looking at people on the PBC side and the Top Rank side that, you know, can't fight each other, won't fight each other you know, you know, which one is it, you know, essentially, you know, I think people like Danny Garcia and Sean Potter, but looking at their, their resume, their body of work over the years, I think they'll fight anyone, especially Sean Potter. The thing is, I think a lot of people don't want to fight Sean Potter because of his style. And, you know, a lot of people aren't the same after you fought Sean Potter. Like he takes a lot out of you with, you know, he's got a rough and ready style, you know, he'll headbutt you, you know, he'll hit you with that, his, his elbows, you know, he's just, just a bull. No, right. You're right. You're completely right. I mean, you know, it is what it is, but he's back in the mix. Uh, also on that card, one of the uh, most, ano- an- or we call him an, ano- not an anom- anomaly. I don't think that's the right word. But six foot six, Sebastian Fondora, who uh, I believe fights under um, Zamfer Promotions, right? With um, Samson Lokowitz, something like that. Um, it's not, it's... The issue, not issue, but the thing behind Sebastian Fondora is not that he's his height, that he's six foot six. It's the fact that he's six foot six and he makes 147 pounds, Mike. What the hell is that? It's insane. You know, this, I I, I saw this fight, Sebastian Fondora against Nathaniel Gallimore. And I was like, dude, I was like, that's a, that's a good, like one of those sneaky good fights. And it was one of those where I looked at it and I was like, you know what, if Fondora wins this, then, you know, he is, you know, pretty legit because the problem we've always had, and I think we kind of both agreed on this, was six foot six, but he never he doesn't fight like a tall fighter. He doesn't sit there and, you know, use his reach, just sit on the outside. He actually fights on the inside, which is just so bizarre because you just sit there and you think you'd use, you know, your height and your reach just to, you know, win rounds quite easily, to, you know, just dominate people, but... Yeah, you know, he went in there, got the, the KO round six over Gallimard, and there's not many people that easily hand Gallimard. So great, great victory for him. You know, on to, you know, bigger and better things. And he was saying afterwards, you know, like, I think he only had three weeks uh, preparation for this. But, you know, if he's going to be a world champion and he wants to be, a, you know, like a, a real professional boxer, then, you know, he'll fight anybody. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. Making 147 pounds at six foot six. I mean, I think that's wild. Wow, because I'm, I'm six foot seven. I'm about six six six. It's just I'm pretty much the same height, and I can never make 147 pounds. That's wild, man. That's ridiculous. But hey, you know what? From a, you know, kind of going back from a marketing standpoint, it's it's interesting because I could see, especially as he starts gaining more traction and more wins, and he's he's on more platforms like that, like Fox and stuff like that. I can see major news outlets using that as a headline six foot six boxer uh fights in a 147 pound division a lot of a lot of casual readers are gonna be like what the hell and they'll click it and they'll they'll read about it or they'll see whatever the content is it's a headline that will catch your attention so you know i'm sure i'm sure obviously he could obviously fight at bigger weight classes all the way up to heavyweight obviously but making 147 pounds obviously that's the money division and if he could do it and it gets him marketing and he it stands him out from the rest why not you know but nobody's going to be able to want to fight him nobody's going to want to fight him because he's way too tall it, people already didn't want to fight paul williams when paul williams was, I was at 6'2 making 147 pounds they're not going to want to fight somebody who's six foot six you know like 
even if even if the talent discrepancy is very big in between both fighters, like let's just say like a Spence and a Flandora, like that height and that re- it's just it's crazy. I don't know. It, it could work though. I mean, you never know, but he can I box. He can definitely box. He's got, yeah. he's got skills. He doesn't just rely on you know his height and his reach because weirdly he doesn't really use it. Right. Crazy man. Crazy. Moving on. Uh, this past weekend on ESPN Plus, Joe Smith knocks another guy out of the ring, essentially, as he stops Aladir Alvarez uh, on the latest uh, main event, on, as I mentioned, on ESPN Plus. And if people remember, Joe Smith knocked out Bernard Hopkins in Inglewood, California, over here at the Forum a couple years ago. He knocked him out of the ring and into retirement. And now he knocks out Alvarez not completely out of the ring like he did to Hopkins, but he pretty much fell out outside the ropes. I mean, Smoltz, Joe Smith, man, he's really making making the most out of his career. Yeah, good, fun fight. Uh, I think I had Joe Smith winning every single round up until, you know, he managed to get him out of there. Um, Alvarez just looked old overnight. You know, I think he's 36 now and actually decided to retire after this loss. But, you know, Joe Smith just took it to him. Good Good fighter, always good to watch, you know. This was for a WBC, like, eliminator. So, you know, he's going to fight either Umar Salimov or Makizam Vlasov for the vacant WBO title, which was obviously previously held by uh, Sergey Kovalev. So, right, Joe big Smith. fights coming up. Joe Smith, man, he has, he has that same story as uh, Andrew Concio. They have similar stories where they, they still work, like, on the side. Um, they still, you know, have their full time jobs or, or or what have you, um, and they were, you know, had some type of titles and stuff like that. So it's a it's, it's an interesting story, man. Joe Smith really uh really lining up his his paydays right here and 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 putting in a lot of work into the sport. You know, good for him, man. I'm a fan. I'm not I'm not ashamed to admit I'm a fan. I like no, I like I, I like him. He's one of those guys. You know, people can relate to him because he works a. Uh, you know, he works a full-time job. I think him and his dad own a business. Uh, it's like like uh, tree trimming or, right. you know, he cuts down trees or something like that. And um, It's crazy, huh? <laughs> you know, it's clever because obviously, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it, you're not guaranteed money all the time. You know, if you lose, then your purses disappear or, you know, injuries and stuff like that. So, if, you know, if anything ever happens or when he retires, you know, he, he he's set. He's got a business to, to go to, which some, you know, some boxers don't. So, it's clever. 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 Uh, co-main event, Rob Brandt, 26-2, and two, gets the fifth-round technical decision over Vitaly Kopelenko. What do you think of Brandt's performance up until that point? I thought it was good. You know, Rob Brandt obviously clearly won every round up to the point where uh, Kopelenko decided to call it, uh, decided to uh, retire. He's got good, um, good energy. He always looks like he comes in, you know, fit and healthy. He's obviously training now with... Uh, Terence Crawford and Jamal Herring, you know those guys always seem to be, you know, beasts. They always come in a lot of running. Obviously, Beast. follow 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 all those guys on the social media. So, nonstop training over there with uh, Big Bo Mac. So, uh-huh. good good victory. And then obviously, you know, we'll see what happens from there. He's hopefully, I think he's aiming for a third fight with uh, Marata, trying to gain back, uh, you know, the title that he lost. You know, he beat Marata rematch, lost it. So, I think he's trying to, you know, go for a third. We'll see. We'll see. And uh, Julian Rodriguez gets the first round stoppage over Anthony Lariano. Uh, Julian Rodriguez, 20 and 0. 20 wins, huh? You know, I, I, does that mean he's he's ready for somebody significant with those all those wins? Undefeated? It looks like it. You know, decent record. You know, good TKO stoppage in this one. Pretty much said he's ready to fight anybody at the 140 division. So, you know, being with top, top rank. Perfect, really. You know they kind of they kind of dominate that division. So, I think it, what he turned around and said, uh, line them up. So, yeah, and they just picked up Regis. Pr- no, I'm sorry, PBC. Scratch that. Scratch that. It would have been great if they. I know they made offers, I believe, to Regis Progre, um, but Regis Progre and Maurice Hooker did sign recently with the PBC. So, and they kinda, can either kind of crazy because you know like. Jose Ramirez and Josh Taylor like hold all the titles in that division, so I don't know why. But I mean, like, but Regis Program and, and and Hooker are are able to fight at 147, so they're probably hoping, hey man, if I can get a good payday with one of these welterweight guys, they're gonna do it. 
Regis will be small at 147, though, right? Is, well, he'd so, be small, so, he's so Crawford, but... Yeah, he'd be smaller, but like he could. I think he'd still fit in. You know, Hooker is the one that really belongs at 147. He's a big kid. Yeah. So interesting. And also, uh, the 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 guy who's 15 minutes of fame is still going. Clay Collard gets the second round TKO over Maurice Williams. Uh, Collard's got a lot of attention right now, at least in the boxing world and the in the niche part of the sport. What'd you think of that? The legend of Clay Collard continues. You know, he's 5-0 in 2020, which I don't think any fighter will get to this year. 3-0 and in the bubble, I believe. I think he's obviously leading the race for the uh, 2020 Fighter of the Year or Fans Fighter of the Year. You know, he's very awkward. has a very different style, but maybe it's just the fact that he comes from MMA. He throws punches from very awkward angles, which I think a lot of your traditional fighters, I kind of think it throws them off because they don't expect it. Um and it's one of those feel-good stories. I think everyone, you know, likes to see the fact that, you know, he went to MMA, it didn't really work out. He came over to boxing, got a lot of draws, a couple of losses early in his career. But, you know, since the turn of this year, he's gone 5-0 and with top rank. And I think, you know, everybody loves that underdog story. So, you know, long may it continue for him. Long may it continue, of course. Um, and then rounding out that card. And no, I don't think I mentioned this from the bubble, obviously, at the MGM Grand on ESPN Plus, another top rank event. Um, but rounding out that card, Duke Reagan gets the first round stoppage, like one of the previous fights, over Luis Alvarado, who suffers a second loss of his early uh, early career. What did you think of that? Not really kind of hard to tell. Obviously, you know, he's pretty skilled. He set up the, uh, the finishing punch really well. Uh, it only lasted 54 seconds. So... You know, listening to what Andy Clark said about him, Andy Clark was hiring him when he obviously because he covers the uh, amateur scene. So good. You know, hopefully they can get him out as much as they can during this uh, coronavirus. Obviously, he's only 23. That was his pro debut. So try and get him some fights, get some experience. But I think he may get fast tracked, you know, with that um, very expansive amateur career. You know, another guy that's going to probably, you know, hit the scene running. Right. I agree. I agree. Uh, and then moving on to this uh, this upcoming weekend, the 29th, Saturday, the 29th of August um, from the BT Sports Studio in London on ESPN+. Plus. Would you call him a rising prospect? Rising heavyweight prospect, soon to be contender, Daniel Dubois uh, returns as he comes back against Ricardo, is it Snyder's? Yeah, for the Snyder's. WBO, for the WBO International uh title obviously Dubois is the main attraction here so what do you what do you think about about this matchup obviously Dubois and Joe Joyce were supposed to initially fight this year but obviously I think COVID obviously affected that so what do you think about this it's supposed to be a stay ready fight for Daniel Dubois because obviously you know Joe Joyce had one recently in which he won and uh, it looked like they were trying to reschedule the fight I think it was for October between Dubois and Joyce but in a recent interview with Daniel Dubois, sorry, Joe Joyce, his you know, manager, uh, Sam Jones. I think it sounded like they may put it back e- even longer due to, uh, I think they, tw- they want to get a crowd in there because of the amount of money they're probably paying the guys. They need to uh, have some sort of income. But I think it's going to be a ready-made opponent for Daniel Dubois. You know, someone he probably goes in there, blows out, looks good against. And then, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, we get to see that huge, you know, British dust-up between him and Joe Joyce. No, obviously I mean, we'd, like, we'd like to see it behind closed doors, but you know, if it, if it doesn't financially make sense for Frank Warren, then you know, it's probably not going to happen until they can at least get you know some kind of crowd in there. Right, right. I mean, I just think that the Dubois Joe Joyce fight it, it's appealing because of who they are, especially in the UK. But I just don't think I don't see it being action packed, mostly because of Joe Joyce. Well, you think Dubois will just take him out, or yeah, probably? I think it's going to be an early night. The problem is, is I think Joe Joyce is, when you look at him, he has a very awkward style. And I think he's just one of those guys that maybe if you're in the ring with him, you kind of appreciate what he does because, you know, he has a very good amateur pedigree. And so far as a pro, you know, he's been in there with a couple of names, which obviously we all know, Stavern. And didn't he also get in there with, was it Jennings? And he took Jennings out? Brian Jennings, yeah. Yeah, you know, when, you know, those two... Uh, you know, Stavern maybe just get blown out by Wilder, but not many others. You know, Jennings, you know, he's no, he's no, uh, he's no knockover. So I think he's just one of those styles. Maybe when you're watching him, he seems like he's very slow, 
very ponderous. But yet again, his name is Juggernaut and the fact that like he's got a great chin and he just goes in there and he just winds you down. He's like the Terminator. He just keeps coming at you that eventually he just pummels you into submission. Pummels into submission. That should be his tagline. If they use that, <laughs> they better re- they better give us credit. Uh, the co-main event of that event, Sonny Edwards 14-0 goes up against Thomas Esomba for the IB- IBF International Superfly Championship. What do you think of this fight? I think it's another one. Another pick for uh, Sonny Edwards. You know, I think uh, someone just to really get him get him back out, you know, due to the COVID, get him a victory and then hopefully get some bigger names at the super flyweight division because for us boxing hardcores, you know, there's some good names in and around the, the super flyweight. So right. it'd be good to see, you know, him out, you know, this would be the turn of next year against one of the bigger names in that division. And then Sam Maxwell, 13-0, goes up against Joe Hughes, 17-5-1. What's your take on that fight? Good fight. I, I actually quite like Sam Maxwell. Uh, it looks like he's, you know, turned the corner a little bit and he's, you know, improving. You know, Joe Hughes, ex-European uh, champion. You know, he's got five losses on his uh, on his resume, but, you know, he's no, he's no pushover. So that should be a good test, really, for Sam Maxwell. Good test. Good test. And then Willie Hutchinson, 11-0, goes up against Luke Black, you know, black, black ledge, black ledge. Sorry, twenty six nine and two. What do you think of that fight? Uh, Willie Hutchinson trained by Dominic Ingle. Good fighter, still, you know, kind of working his way into the pro game after having, you know, a pretty good amateur career. You know, you know coming from the Ingle gym, he's surrounded by, you know, very talented fighters. You know, people popping in there like uh, Billy Joe Saunders. You've got Galahad coming out of that gym, and you know, many others. So I, you know, Willie seems to be pretty good from what from what we can tell. You know, I think this should be somebody that gives him more rounds than normal. So good test to basically Willie Hutchinson, you know, should take it. Willie Hutchinson. And then uh he's opponent opponentless. David Adelaya, two and zero. It goes up against the dread the dreaded, the famous, the infamous TBA. Tough. You know, TBA, very experienced. You know, had many fights, sometimes fights multiple fights a night on the same card, as yeah. we've seen. So you Undefeated. Know, but looking at David Adelaide, he looks like a good prospect. I think anyone to really put him in there for, he should blow him out. You know, David Adelaide is huge. He, look, he looks the part. You know, whether he's going to be, you know, be technically good, we'll see over time. Uh, been in there and sparred with Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury, you know, said that, you know, that he seems a good prospect. Tyson always seems to test himself when he's with well, camp. He normally gets a lot of young, hungry guys in there. So, you know, he's generally a good, uh, good asses- he has a good assessment of all the young guys coming through. So he, he, he says he's good. I'll agree with Tyson. He says he's good. We'll agree. We'll agree. Mm-hmm. And then rounding off this weekend from the bubble once again at the MGM Grand on regular ESPN, Jose Ramirez, the unified WBC and WBO super lightweight world champion, uh, defends both of his titles against Victor Postol, the veteran Victor Postol, who's been in quite a few fights over the last several years. Um, I don't, I don't think this is going to be competitive. I think Postol is past his prime. Um, I'd want to be surprised because I. I like Postal, especially when he beat uh, Lucas Matisse out here at the Stub Hub years ago. Um, but, I mean, I remember when Crawford beat him. Uh, that was in Vegas as well, I believe at the MGM Grand. Um, I think that was Crawford's first pay-per-view, um, which because they needed to pay both of them or they needed to make money off of it, but it didn't do that well. But I like Jose Ramirez. I'm glad he's coming back and he's, he's doing a defense of his title and stuff like that, but I don't think this is going to be competitive. I think Ramirez is going to mop the floor with him. Whoa! Yeah, okay. I'm, going, I'm going that route. I'm doing it. But I, I'll be honest, you know, I used to think Jose Ramirez was kind of a little bit protected because they used to make so much money with him up in Fresno. You know, he had a breakout performance, in my opinion, when he fought Mo Hooker, and I was like, you know what? Man, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe he is the real deal. This is another opponent. I think I agree. I think Jose Ramirez should really win this. But Postal's only ever been beaten by some of the really best. You know, like you said, he's been beaten by Crawford. So. It's yeah, not like, like it's been years though. When's the last time Postal's fought anybody significant since Crawford? Or you know, 
I'd have to look at the who he beat to get into this position, to be honest with you. Um, but I think, you know, Postel is all, older. I think Ramirez should win. But I don't think see Ramirez going in there and just blasting him out. I think, you know, Postel will give him rounds. I think he'll make him work. And I think it's another performance that we'll be able to look at Ramirez and say, you know what? You know, he is a real dealer. He is, you know, I he's think, a world I, champion. He's not just holding that title. Yeah, no, I could agree. I, I agree. I agree that... I think initially he was Jose was Jose Ramirez was kept in Fresno up in Northern California because they were he was selling out that arena up there and they were making money with him and they were milking that. I agree with that. He was a little bit protected, but I think you kind of have to throw that out the window. I, I I never doubted his talent. I always recognized the talent, even though he was up there and they were keeping him in Fresno to sell tickets. I I could always from the eye test. I always I could always tell like no this guy's good. He's got talent, and then like you said. Him beating Mo Hooker in it, which was an exciting fight. I think that you you definitely have to give him credit after that. So, I like Ramirez, man. I think he, he he's one of the best fighters at 140, maybe even one in one of the best fighters in the whole in the whole sport. Um, and he's honestly the only, from a top rank standpoint, he's honestly the only significant name that could possibly move up to 147 and fight Crawford because Crawford obviously can't get any people from PBC. But I say uh, I say Ramirez stops Postal and inside seven, maybe six, six, no seven. I'm saying seven. I could see that. I think Ramirez may stop him in the in the later rounds. You know, I think he may, you know, just wind him down. Postal is now 36. He hasn't really fought too many times over the last like five years. I think some years he's only fought once. I think last year he fought twice. So right. I think, you know, maybe old father time may give him his third loss. You know, he's only lost to uh, Crawford and Josh Taylor. So he's not lost to... Uh, yeah. I mean, he's been in there with some good guys, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he has, like you say, you know, he's been in there with Matisse. So I think, you know, it's probably somebody that top rank have looked at and picked and said, you know what, Ramirez should really beat Postal. He's another name onto the resume. You know, Ramirez wins this. Hopefully we get the unification between him and Josh Taylor. And I think one, if not both of them, may step up to 147 money division. Cheddar Ching, you know, get some big cash against, you know, Terence Crawford and maybe how even about, do a, a round robin of those guys at 147. How much do you think Ramirez is getting any type of pressure behind the scenes from top rank to go up to 147 because they, they're in desperate need of some type of significant opponent for Crawford? I think that, you know, they may have had a conversation about that, you know, told him like, hey, we'll give you Postal, we'll give you Josh Taylor, and then you can step up and, you know, regardless of, you know, win, win, lose or draw against uh, Josh Taylor, you guys both step up to the 147 division, which is the money division. And because Crawford is, when you've got people like, what, Kel Brook, Chris Van Herden, um I'm trying to think of other crazy people that they've looked at sticking Terence Crawford in with, it's it's no good, you know. Like PBC, uh, whether they are holding you know all their guys hostage and laughing at Terence Crawford because they know he's got nobody to fight. What would you think? You know, we give Ryan Garcia somebody like Ryan Garcia and you know Canelo or something all this all this shit because like they say like oh no I, I don't want this opponent I want to fight somebody good or I want to do this or I want to do that or or they don't want to fight certain people and stuff like that. Do you think Crawford should do that with top rank? I mean, like, yeah, it looks bad on the promoter fighter relationship, but I mean, it at least puts some heat to make those fights or to not make those fights. Like, do you think Crawford needs to do something like that? I I think we've said it more than once on the podcast. Yeah, I think he does. I think he needs to put pressure, you know, like whoever he fights next afterwards, jump on the mic and, you know, call him out. Do a WWE stuff. I don't know. I don't don't, don't, like that. I, I think he needs to sound that horn now. It's not whoever he fights next. I, I think he's overdue for that. Because, like, unless he fights somebody prominent next, which in terms of prominence, it would be have to be one of the PBC guys. I mean, who else is out there who could, you know, who could give him that type of, that type of, you know, marquee matchup? I think that horn needs to be sounded now, you know? Because I think the biggest name that he could fight and – He's not really the same anymore as Kel Brook. And I, I think if we carry on like we are, that I think that's who we'll see. I think they'll throw money at 
Kel Brook okay. because he, yeah. he's known on both shards. He's known obviously in England. He's known over here from his time against Sean Potter. And I think it'll be a retirement fight for him. And you know, Terence will go in there, probably beat him if if Kel can even make one forty seven anymore. Well, I don't so. think he can. I don't think he can. But whatever. Well, whatever. It's going to be interesting though. And then uh, rounding off that card, Arnold Barboza, friend of the show. He's been on the show before. Uh, twenty three and zero. Puts up his undefeated record against Tony Luis, 29-3. and three. Uh, Barboza should win this fight. Um, I think after this, especially at his record, and you know he's getting a lot of praise and a lot of attention now, I think Barboza needs to fight uh, a name after this fight. What do you think? I would agree with that. You know, obviously he's in, you know, in, in the same weight division as, you know, Josh Taylor, Ramirez, um, Ranked 13th in the world on box rec, so I think I think you're right. You know he's undefeated, so he, he's uh, somebody that you know some of the big names may want to fight just to take his O. You know, get an unbeaten prospect on to, on his record. Just needs to carry on like he he did before, and hopefully you know get a few KOs against people. You know, draw that attention. You know, because he's he's got a lot of uh, decisions on his record. You know, yeah. he, he's not loud and brash and go out there and you know brings attention to himself. So he needs to either, you know, jump on the mic or, you know, let the uh, let his hands do the talking and, you know, start, you know, smoking a few people. Smoking him. Smoking him. Arnold Barboza. But, yeah, I'd like to see him get, get, get like, a pretty decent opponent um, after this fight. And then maybe we can uh, – maybe after this weekend's fight, we can get him back on the show in the coming months. And then maybe we can get a call out. Maybe he'll call somebody out on the last round. What do you think, Mike? Can we do that? Can always reach out, see what he says. Maybe Jose Pedraza. They're both on top rank, right? Yeah, that could work. Pedraza, I think Pedraza still got some left. Maybe I think he's a name on your record, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but that was a lot of fights. It's been a while since we went through a, a lot of fights like that in in depth and in detail. But it was uh it was nice to go through all these cards. You know, obviously, it's great that boxing is in the swing of things. All these sports are in the swing of things all over the world now, which is great. Not great, great not only for fans but for the television audience. Oh, and then one more thing before we sign off: the football stadium, the American football stadium out here in LA in Inglewood, California, SoFi Stadium for the Los Angeles Rams and Los Angeles Chargers. I believe just opened in terms of ha- being able to use the field. It's pretty much. I think it's done. I think it's done because the the football team there started having like scrimmages. And then um, they've been posting video of inside and using the, the big old screen and all that stuff. So, you know, that's obviously another location to be look at to be staging mega fights. And, you, and obviously it would have to be a mega fight, you know, like a Canelo and maybe a Triple G or something like that. Um, but That's two because obviously you've got the one in Vegas as well. That's so right. You've got two big stadiums, you know, vying for uh, some big fights. I'll be a- Yeah, so... That gives uh, uh, that gives Los Angeles another arena to work with, but obviously it would have to be a mega fight to at least put enough butts in seats there because I think it's what fifty, sixty thousand. I don't know. It's a big stadium. It's, it's a football big. stadium. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. But it should be should be interesting. But uh, you know, signing off here before we uh, we sign off here. Go ahead and tell people where they can follow us online, Mike. <laughs> So at the last round 12 on Twitter and Instagram, and obviously join us next week. We'll be reviewing all the fights we spoke about and obviously previewing the uh, Jamel Herring against Jonathan Oquendo, uh, which is coming at you from the bubble, MGM Grand. And, you know, obviously on the line is a potential Jamal Herring and Cal Frampton fight. So good luck to Jamal Herring on that because he's had some bad luck with his whole COVID-19 situation. So <laughs> hopefully... Hopefully this works out, man. Hopefully this works out because he's been. I can, I can tell he's been frustrated because of this. You know, he's he's also a friend of the show. He's been on the show before, but, um, you know, I'm sure he's very frustrated about not being able to fight. And, and hopefully this is it. You know, how much would it suck if the day before or the day of, hey, he got it again or it got scrapped because of this? Man, what a turn of events, man. 2020 sucks. It really does. I, I, I'm frustrated because you know we should have pretty much had that fight by now or it should be you know scheduled and you know we should only be a few weeks away from that fight so you know if if they're willing to put that on behind closed doors during covid it's one of the better fights that we've had so fingers crossed fingers crossed finger crossed uh so thanks again guys for listening whether you're on apple podcast spotify stitcher 
we appreciate it. And like Mike said, tune in next week as we review the review and preview the next events coming up in the sport of boxing. So for my co-host, Michael Shepard, I'm Danny Z. This is the last round. Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.